Area 941 podcast are produced and distributed by Community Powered 94.1 KPFA Radio. Please help support Area 941 at kpfa.org. I'm Richard Walensky. This is KPFA's Bay Area Theater podcast, featuring stage reviews, along with extended versions of interviews heard on Arts Waves on Cover to Cover. My guest is Annette O'Toole, who is one of the leading actors in the play The Good Book by Dennis O'Hare and Lisa Peterson, directed by Lisa Peterson, at Berkeley Rep's Pete's Theater through June 9th. Annette O'Toole has had a long career in television, film, and theater, including stints as Clark Kent's mother, Martha Kent, on Smallville, as the star of the TV series The Huntress, and most recently in stints on the current Netflix series, The Punisher, and the upcoming series, Virgin River. She has also appeared in leading and supporting roles on film, and more recently has appeared in several off-Broadway productions. This interview was recorded a week before previews began for The Good Book. Annette O'Toole, The Good Book is uh, a tripartite play three sections, one of which includes a young man who's got issues with his belief system, a woman who teaches the Bible but is an atheist, Mm -hmm. and the story of the writing of the Bible itself, and it's by Dennis O'Hare and Lisa Peterson. What brought you to this project? Lisa was the main thing. I've worked with Lisa a couple of other times, and I just adore her. I, I think she's brilliant, and anything she is involved in, I want to be part of, and especially this because she is the co-writer. And then, of course, I read it and I was hooked. You know, when I I read something and it scares me, it scares me as an actor and it scares me in terms of just everything about it. I think that's that's a good sign. It means it's something I should really take into consideration. But there there was no consideration. I, I adore both these people. I had never worked with Dennis before, but now having been around him in a room, he's so incredibly articulate. And I, I find myself trying to be at my best 100% of the time because he's there. And I just think it's a brilliant play. I, I'm learning so much through my research about the Bible. And I was raised Catholic. So, you know, as, as, as Dennis and I both say, Catholics don't read the Bible. We, we get into the New Testament, but the old part of it. Like, eh. So I'm learning a lot and uh, enjoying my, my research. It opened uh, originally, I think, in uh, 2015 in Chicago. And I read some of the reviews which kind of said that the pieces didn't quite hang together as they could hang. Did Dennis O'Hare and Lisa Peterson do a lot of rewriting for this version? They did, as far as I know. I didn't read the original piece. I don't read reviews. It's like kind of means nothing to me at this point. No, it's a completely re. You know, it's the same basic premise, right. but I, I think they've rewritten it a lot. Of, I don't have a lot of information about that, except that I know that even in the room they've been working, and still every day we get changes here and there. They're very meticulous. They work very hard, and they want to make everything as clear as they can. And I know our previews will they will still be working and honing and you know, cutting and adding and all the things they do that that make our jobs uh, even more interesting than they normally are. The one thing I was not getting a sense of is what is this play in relation to comedy, drama, both? How does that work for this particular play? It's it's both. It's it's, it's just kind of everything. You know, the Bible brings up in, in each person who everybody has a connection to it, whether you believe it or not, whether you're religious or not. You know, it's a it's a an amazing piece of literature. Even Richard Dawkins, in my research about that, he says, read the Bible. It's, it's, I so respect the making of the, this piece of, uh, you know, because it's, as I say in the play, it's the work of human hands. It, it's a very dangerous piece of, of literature. And it's something that everybody, even today, you know, we, we have all this hubbub about it and, and people's beliefs about it and the things they think they have very wrong and the things that, you know, are wonderful in it, the poetry and the, and the gorgeous all the wisdom literature, which is my character's specialty, the Ecclesiastes and Proverbs and Song of Songs and all that amazing poetical uh, literature. Since you're playing a teacher of the Bible, you're doing all of this studying (laughs) on your own as well to get some kind of background into how she's going to present the discussion. Right. Um, yes, and it's it's a little difficult for me because I never went to college even, so this is a big acting feat for me. But it's fun to play someone who is so knowledgeable and is so sure of her 
not just of her subject, but of her beliefs and her the way she deals with people, especially younger people, and how that's changing now, how kids and the way they receive information through all this technology that they have access to now and, and everything that's right at their fingertips. And she has a group of fundamentalist students who come to her class and like to question, you know, and she has to be very, very respectful of the fact that, you know, their beliefs um, are very important to them and she has to deal with them in a particular way that she doesn't with her other students. So that that's an issue for her. Do you sit there and as you're working on this, do you turn to Dennis O'Hare and start asking him questions or Lisa about the character and what you should emphasize? It, you know, it's a very collaborative process and we all sit there together and we didn't do a lot of what they call table work for this play because it's it's a very big piece and they wanted to get it on their feet as quickly as they could. So the questions are being asked and answered kind of through osmosis, although we do sit and talk about it as well. I mean, it's 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 an, a fascinating piece, and and I've never done anything quite like it. That's so big, about so much, and it's a very large role for me. And uh, just keeping my stamina up for, but but you know, it's like when you go to start exercising and you feel like, oh, I can do more today. It's the same with acting. If you're exercising the muscles every day, it seems like you're capable of a little bit more, and you push yourself. They are so generous, uh, Dennis and Lisa, Lisa especially since she is the director of the room. And Dennis has been hopping back and forth to, to London where he's doing Tartuffe. So he's got the, all these massive things he's doing. But still, he says, email me anytime, call me anytime. I want to know what's going on. He's, he's very much in the room. And as Lisa says, if anything comes up and he's not around, she says, well, I have to uh, consult the writers about this. So she, it means that she and Dennis will, will have their Skype time come back and answer our questions about anything that comes up. A lot of the actors and I were saying the other day, gosh, we, we wish we had another week in the rehearsal room because there's just so much. But then once we got into the theater and we started our tech, I thought, no, there's so much that we cannot be done until we're in the actual space because that's where the play lives. And, you know, places we thought that we would exit and, and enter, they're not working anymore. And and just being there with the lights and the, and the sound that comes through, and um, it, it's just... We're now in the world of the play, and it's it's very magical. And I'm I'm actually looking forward to something that I don't normally look forward to, which is having the audience there. Um, I like when the audience is there, but but this time I'm kind of craving having that response and seeing how they react to certain things, which are a bit I don't know how to put it, in, in, not incendiary, but but you know controversial. Annette O'Toole, you've done a. Uh tremendous amount of television. Mm -hmm. You've done three or four or five series as a regular, mm -hmm. most notably from what I could gather, many, many episodes of Smallville. Yes, yeah. Many episodes. But you've done a lot, and you even have a new one coming up, which mm -hmm. we'll talk about in a minute. But uh, comparing the process, your process as an actor, working on a stage piece, because you've also done a lot of stage, versus working on a series through time like Smallville or The Punisher or any of those versus just doing one shots or movies. I mean, so that's kind of three processes. <laughs> well, I think most actors say the same things. It's, it's all the same. You know, we're acting, but there are different muscles you use for each, each thing. Uh, I love working in the theater more than anything. And I've done it not exclusively, but but primarily in the last ten years, because the now that I'm older, the roles that I really want to do that are you know that people want me to do are mostly on the stage. And I love that feeling of every time you do it, you start from the beginning. It is your work and your and your castmates and your audience participation work that goes on, and it's this different kind of brew that happens every time, and it's thrilling. And I love the feeling afterwards when you think back of, uh, on the performance and think, oh, God, that went well. And you, But you can't plan it for the next time. You can think, well, that worked well. I don't quite know how that worked, but let's see how it does goes again. And then you'll have a whole different audience with a whole different set of things they're bringing to the theater and to the play. So I, I just love that process. When you're working in film or television, of course, it's not it's your work, but it's really the directors and the producers putting it together in the editing room and making it look a certain way. A lot of times they'll say, oh, don't, 
you know, we'll, we'll fix that in post, meaning we'll alter your performance <laughs> so it's, it's unrecognizable to you, which means that I don't like to watch myself on film very much. I, I never did, but I would because it was a learning process about, well, this works and that, I shouldn't do that. And I make, why do I make that face? And so I, now I just don't enjoy it very much. So like, my God, I look three billion years old. And why, how did that happen? And, you know, it's, I don't, that didn't come off the way I thought. And, um, but I, I, I know you're going to talk about this, this new uh, project. And I just went in to do some ADR on it. And I was very, very pleasantly surprised at how much I was enjoying watching it. And I, I wished the scenes would go on so I could see more rather than just my little part that I was redoing vocally. When you're working in a series mm -hmm. um, and you're developing a character, for someone like Martha Kent, do you at some point go, oh, I own this character? And I mean, how does that work for somebody who's in a series for a long time? Or I'm trying to remember, is that Hope in uh, Virgin oh, River? Oh, yes. Hope McRae in Virgin River. Yeah. Well, you know, what happens is you kind of, I mean, when you play it a long time, and you, you know, Martha Kent in, in Smallville, she's a particular person in the comic book. She is the mother of Superman. And she's, uh, of course, in Smallville, there was no Superman. We, right. It was Clark Kent, and he had not become that yet. So we were kind of helping him be the, be that hero. It was tremendous fun. I loved the cast. Tom, I thought Tom Welling did an amazing job. And, and John Glover and I became fast friends, and we still are. He played Lionel Luther, and he was sort of our, our you know, arch enemy. But what happens is you start to know the character so well, particularly the one that, that you know you see on the page and that you're kind of combining with the comic book world. And um, that was really fun. You know, it's it, it light. So uh, I enjoyed doing that. And, and the producers would sometimes, you know, the showrunners would sometimes ask me my opinion about things because I'm, I'm in the trenches. You know, I'm playing that character every every episode. And, and they would say, how do you think she would feel about this? So it was nice to be taken into consideration. With Virgin River, this this new Netflix series that I just finished, it's based on a series of books, incredibly popular romance genre books. That character is not particularly featured in the series in the book series, so it was one of the ones where the our amazing showrunner Sue Tenney took that character and kind of ran with it because she wanted an older woman in it. She wanted her to be. I'm the mayor of the town now. I don't think I was in the in the books. I read. I got the first book, and I'm barely in that book. So I was trying to get information because you like to base it on right. on reality. So I was kind of making it up with Sue on the fly. And the more I would do, uh, the more she would see and write towards that. And I got to work again with Tim Matheson, who I love and hadn't worked with for 30-something years. But we just kind of fell right back into, you know, into step together. And, and we play opposite one another. And he's the doctor of the town. And it's fun. I think it's it's um, it's going to be an interesting, good, beautifully shot series. Dave Peltier, who's our our DP, is I think a genius, and uh, does works with light in a way I don't think I've ever seen done that I've worked with. Is working on a series where they drop the whole thing at once is that a different calendar than say if you're working in a regular weekly series on network? Uh, no, it's pretty much the same. It's really? very, very hard work in, in terms of our work. Uh, once it drops, though, I was in Vancouver working on um, Virgin River, and when The Punisher came out, and I had some young guys who were visiting Vancouver, and I don't know where they were from, but they, they were not from Canada or, or the United States, and they had accents of some kind that came up to me and said, are you in The Punisher? And they were... So excited because that's the art market for that that show. <laughs> Young guys, you know, we're all over the world. They love The Punisher. And I'm not a very nice person in that. In fact, I'm pretty evil. So they were very happy to see me. And uh, I was shocked because I thought, oh, my God, they sat down and watched this entire series in one day. And they already know that I'm the bad, <laughs> the bad guy. And a, not, a few times I was stopped in Vancouver by, by people who had seen the whole thing. So that's the value of it. It's not like you know, they can just, you know, see, take it all at once if they want to. Uh, way back when you did the Huntress and you were the good guy and now you're the bad guy. <laughs> Is it more fun to be the bad guy? Um, I don't know. You know, acting's fun. I just, I like doing all of it. It's nice to be able to, to play both sides of it. I, as I get older, I'm, I'm asked to do a lot of different types of roles and I'm kind of amazed that people think I can do it, and I somehow I, I, I you know I pull it out of the toolbox, the old toolbox, I guess it would be. 
And um, yeah, it's just, I, I enjoy acting more than I ever have in my life. And I keep wondering why that is. And I, I think it's because my kids are grown and I'm not worried about them quite as much. <laughs> well, b back in those days, what you really wanted was a full-time job. And these things are, I mean, yeah. this is, this is daily work. I mean, Smallville was what, eight years? Uh, Smallville six. ran for 10 years, but I was on it for six. And then I came back and did a few guest star roles, which is much nicer because the, you know, they put you in a hotel and they drive you. and It's very nice. <laughs> um, I was curious about something. When in, in a lot of the series now, certain characters appear, then they disappear, then they reappear. Are those separate contracts or are you signing something whenever you want me come in? How does that work? It's all different, you know, and at any time you can be let go. Even if you're a regular, if they decide they don't like your character or they don't like you, they will write you out. They they have the power, and that's fine, you know. If you're recurring, you don't. You, you, they, I think more. This seems like what is like like for the Punisher. Say they hire you for a certain block of time, and they say you're going to work out of 14 episodes. You're going to work in six of them, and here they are. So you're pretty much booked for that time, as if you were a regular, because they can change it on you. Oh. So you have they have first right of first. Use like I'm not sure what the term is, but you are hired by them. So any other work you get, um, say they want you for a guest starring role on This Is Us, then which didn't happen to me, but it just came <laughs> right, to my yeah, mind. Yeah. Um, they have to work it out with the it, with the producers, and if they're very nice, they will help you do it. And if they're not, they'll say not that it's not nice. It's just they are your employer, right? And right. they can either help you do that or not, and. Uh, it's understandable that they wouldn't do that because they don't have to. But most of the times they do. They're, they're usually pretty good about that. Uh, during all those years, you were still doing theater occasionally, weren't you? During uh, during the years that you were a regular on these various, on Smallville, on uh, The Huntress? Not, no, not on Smallville. I wasn't because my kids were young and I wasn't taking much, not that it was coming to me that much, right. but um, I wasn't doing a lot in between. And that was a nine-month season oh, really? you know, of work. Yeah, and then the in the hiatus time, the younger people would get movies and, and things, but I rarely did then. Once Smallville ended, though, I, I went to New York and I made it a... Uh, I went back and forth. I didn't go to live in New York, but I, I made it a priority that I really wanted to do theater. You've also written songs yes. uh, with your husband, Michael McKean. Yes. Uh, who's an amazing actor. I agree. <laughs> Absolutely amazing. You should know him. You'd, you'd like him better as a person, actually. <laughs> well, um, right. his work on uh, Better Call Saul yeah. is just astonishing. I, I mean, so you too. know, and of course, Spinal Tap. Yeah. Uh, when he was working on that, um, were you guys together at that on point? On This is Spinal Tap? Yeah. No. Oh, no that that was, in fact, they're having their 35th anniversary of the film coming out, and they're all going to be at Tribeca, the, the Spinal Tap guys. Uh, doing a, uh, a, I think, a Q and A and a kind of a salute to the film and a showing of the movie. You guys wrote a song for a Mighty Wind, and it got nominated for an Oscar. It did. It was very exciting. I was so glad. We were both very glad that we got to go through that. If we're going to go through that crazy process of going to the Academy Awards, that we did it together, because it's like, oh my God, it's my nightmare. I, it, that all that part of being an actor is is difficult for me. What? The, the kind of like going to events and being seen in red carpets. And I just think it's so silly and stupid. And why? Why? And I actually admire the actors now, young actors and actresses who are coming up and they do that. It's such a big part of their job, you know, in social media and going on TV and talking. Oh, God. So that that was not a fun process. But writing for us is we still do it. We still love writing music. And um, that was the second song we wrote together officially and uh we felt very very proud and we love the love the movie and and love the we sing the song all the time ourselves well you seem pretty calm about celebrity itself you said people are coming up to you mm -hmm. so you're over that i mean yeah, uh, yeah. i mean at this point for you is the celebrity thing a big deal at all no it was never anything that i saw it or you know it, it's just it's nice people come up to me a lot and say did didn't we go to high school together or, you know, um, weren't you my son's teacher? <laughs> you know, like, which means you've infiltrated their, their lives in a way that you feel you seem like a real person to them rather than a celebrity. And then they'll, they'll say, oh, God, no, I know you from this and I loved your work. And they're very kind people who come up to me or they're like these young guys who came up and were just kind of thrilled and tickled to, to, to see me in, in person. 
Ned O'Toole, a couple of things that I want to bring it back to the good book. Mm -hmm. uh, you began your career, you were born in, in Texas, mm -hmm. and you studied dance when you were a little, little girl. Come to L.A., did you want to be an actress? How did that first dance, you said you were on Danny Kaye, uh -huh. how did that come about? And then how did you get into acting with My Three Sons? Well, my mother and my aunt owned a dancing school in Houston, Texas for 50 years. So I grew up in the dancing school. I grew up with that kind of, you know, women around me who were very, you know, who worked and who were in, in the arts and very much in that, that world. Um, uh, Patrick Swayze's mother, Patsy Swayze, was one of their peers in, in that world. And we would go to conventions and dance, you know, and I, I always thought I was going to be a dancer. And I was a dancer for pro professionally for two years. So we moved to, to L.A. when I was very young because my, my cousin wanted to go to art school there. And my dad was going all over the world uh, working. So we, it just kind of seemed like, well, let's go try it out. They wanted to see if, if I would... Um, work and, and film and stuff. And I really wanted to. The first job I got was on the Danny Kaye show uh, playing Gwen Verdon. Uh, uh, Verdon Fossey now is very, or Fossey Verdon, whatever. She should be first, actually, in my opinion. Um, but uh, the, the series is out now, so right. that's who that is, Gwen Verdon. She was the guest star on the Danny Kaye show, and I they did a production number starring her, and I played young Gwen Verdon. Oh, cool. So uh, it's a very small segment, and but that was my first... Uh, professional experience. And my mother framed the first dollar bill when they gave me the check. We took it to the bank and she said, I want the very first dollar bill that you hand to her. She took it and she framed it. So I still have it in my den. And then I got an agent and it just kind of went from there. And I didn't have great success as a child actor, which I'm very happy about actually. But I studied a lot and I went on meetings and I got an agent and then my agent wanted me to have acting lessons. And I had a very big chip on my shoulder about that. I thought, well, I need acting lessons. I'm going to be in musicals. I'm going to do this. And then I, when I was about 17, I went into an acting class that Robert Ellenstein had. Robert Ellenstein, if you've seen the movie North by Northwest, yeah. the two bad guys who kidnap Cary Grant at the beginning, he's the guy with the hat on. Okay. Lovely man, very talented actor, uh, wonderful teacher. And I walked into that class and I kind of fell in love with the whole process. And I thought, thought, wow, I don't have to stand behind people and dance and make them look better and be support. I can be out front and I can do this job till the day I die. And I, I just loved the work itself. I just, it kind of opened up a whole new world for me. That's been my primary focus. It's been nice to, to have the dancing training and the musical training because I've used it in some things I've done. And of course, when Michael and I started writing music together, it, it helped in that. Uh, at what point did you begin doing theater then? When I was 15, I did a play called Blue Denim, which started out as a play and then became a movie with uh, Brandon DeWilda and Carol Lindley a long, long time ago. And that was my first, you know, I'd done plays. I'd done, I'd studied right. acting, but that was the first thing I did as an actress in a, in a real play, in a real production of a play. What was great about it was the kids in it are 15 and I was 15. And a lot of the stuff that was going on, you know, I just, I was very sheltered as a kid. You know, all I really cared about was my work. This was the late 60s, so yeah. there was a lot of stuff going on yes. around the world. The whole hippie world, and, yeah. and but you were not part of it. You were just busy well, acting? or Yeah, it was around me. I, my focus was so on dance at that time and, and theater and um that I didn't, you know, it was swirling around me. You couldn't avoid it. I was out in Los Angeles with all this stuff going on, but it, it was what I was doing was of, of the utmost importance to me, and I kind of had blinders on. During those years when you were younger, uh, we talk about the Me Too movement now. Did mm -hmm. you have any issues, or were you kind of free? <laughs> you know, it's funny. I never... I, I never had anything really bad happen to me. People would come on to me. They'd say, oh, you want to come to Las Vegas for the weekend? I'd say, well, can I bring my boyfriend? they say, what? And, you know, I, and I had a boyfriend. It wasn't like I was lying. I just couldn't understand why would you want me to come to Las I mean, I really was, I, I guess I was just naive about all that stuff. And maybe I didn't pick up on signals that were out there. But I was also very lucky in that I was never in a situation that got dangerous or scary. I don't know why that is. I just never was around it. I would hear people talk about it, but I didn't really experience it very much. 
Um, and they always needed people like me who, like in, when I first started, when I turned 18, I started working a ton. And so maybe it's just because I was working a lot and studying acting so much. I don't know how I, I kind of avoided that whole thing, but I, I hear it and it breaks my heart. And I think it's, I certainly saw evidence of it, but I didn't even know anybody who was that affected by what I'm hearing today, these horrible stories. The Huntress, you were the main character. Did, were you also a producer of that? I felt like one, but I didn't have the title or the money, but I certainly devoted a lot of my, <laughs> my I, I, the thing I remember most about The Hunters is coming home and being so exhausted that Michael would have to carry me up the steps. And it wasn't the exciting Rhett Butler carrying Scarlett O'Hara up the steps. It was like, <laughs> she, he had to kind of haul me up, you know, like throw me in bed. Like I was so tired after that. That's the hardest job I've ever done, I think. Besides this one, the, the good book is pretty hard too. Well, I mean, it's kind of different environment. Yeah. Uh, but getting back to the good book, a couple of quick questions. When you're looking at the play as a whole, what do you see as the primary themes, the things that you grasp onto? Gosh, that's a hard question, Richard. You know, it's so big. It's a, it's an epic play. And, you know, I'm in the middle of it. So it's hard to know what, how it's appearing to, to people. But for me, it's just this woman's, she's very different for me because she's very abrasive and she doesn't care what people think. And she's incredibly knowledgeable and, and maybe the smartest person in any room she walks into. And I, I'm not like that. But she has a dedication, a, a, a complete devotion to her work that I share. And she's at a point, though, in her career, she's gotten to the place where they're get, handing her retirement papers. She's a, a professor at a university, and they're saying, okay, it's time for you to go write your next book. Go move on. And she's getting that, and she's seeing these kids who are coming in who are, are a asking her. Th they feel like they need to have a dialogue with her. When she's used to say, I'm the teacher, your, your job is to listen to what I'm trying to impart all this knowledge that I have, I want to give to you, but you're kind of putting up a, not a wall, but, but, but this defense thing. So I guess that's what it is. She's in a situation I'm not in. I feel like what I said, I can do this job to the day I die. If they, I'm knocking some wood that I, you know, I get to, to do this up until the end. She doesn't have that luxury. She has to change and, and she's finding her personal life is changing at the same time. So it's, it's about monumental change, and it happens around the Bible, and it's about what the Bible... It's about, she says it in the play, can you find meaning without belief? That's her goal. And she finds tremendous meaning in the Bible, good and bad, but she does not believe it because she doesn't believe God wrote it. She believes, as is the case, human beings wrote it, whether they were moved by God or, or some spiritual force. That's something everybody can relate to, I think. Annette O'Toole, quickly on talking about Virgin River, you said your character's the mayor. Mm -hmm. It's about a young midwife nurse practitioner who comes to this town, which takes, it, it's in Northern California. It's a made up town, but it's right around, you know, the Humboldt County area. Right. So there are a lot of pot camps around, some of which are legal, a lot of which are not. So that's, an, that's kind of a, a dark side to things that are going on because our doctor, Tim Matheson, it goes to those camps and is helping all those people. He says, I don't care whether things are legal or not. My job is to help these people if they need medical care. So he's strapped. He's spread very thin, and he needs help. So this young woman, played by Alexandra Breckenridge, comes to Virgin River to be his helper. And at first, he's very resistant. And I'm the one who's brought her there. I've hired her to come. It's a family show, which is nice, because I don't think Netflix has a ton of, of content like that. And I think it's smart of them to do it. And it's uh, it's it's just beautifully written and, and, and I think um, directed. So we have wonderful directors who came in and did 10 episodes. When does it drop, do you know? Do you know? I don't know. There's been talk about it, but I, I haven't heard for sure. Do you have any passion projects, anything you really, really want to do? I do have a passion project, but I can't talk about it because it's, not, it's just coming together and being solidified, and, but it's very exciting, and there's music involved, I can say, with, with some, yeah, it's, it's just very, and it's, it's Michael and me. The Good Book by Dennis O'Hare and Lisa Peterson, directed by Lisa Peterson at Berkeley Rep's Pete's Theater through June 9th. For more information, you can go to berkeleyrep.org.